Welcome to Talk in Maine. I'm Tom Saviello. Some of you may be tuning in to see Mr. Corey talk about Wilton and its history. But we had to flop things a little bit. So I was able to get my good friend, Deputy Chief Ross, to come in and talk You're about welcome. emergency response and some little history about emergency supplies and so forth. So, Clyde, thanks for coming in. Oh, you're Appreciate welcome. it. You're, you're a young man, and yes. you've been, in, been involved with the fire service or rescue service, emergency response for how many years? Well, I've been at it for 50 years. I, so you start, I said, started when you were 10? I started early because my dad and uncle were both firefighters back oh, really? in, the, in the war years. And, uh, of course, we grew up with the fire trucks and fire service. And eventually, uh, in 1971, I decided to make a plunge, and I was accepted. Cool. Now, we go back, you and I were kind of talk, yeah. talking about how the fire service used to be back in the day. I can remember growing up that the fire department in my little town in New Jersey was a party place. I mean, yes, they came out and probably put out the fires or contained them, let's say that, but nowhere went into the buildings and stuff. It, was it like that here, too? We uh, didn't have what they call self-contained breathing apparatus for quite a number of years, and if you recall... When we had the big fire downtown, uh, we had one air pack, and very few people knew how to use it. And it was a 15-minute pack. Uh, quite a change in the years since that period of time. Is it really was 9/11 really the impetus to get more of the changes, or was it already happening before? It had already started before that, um, and there were numerous companies that were selling them, and then of course the the uh, cost of them was prohibitive. And then you had to train, and it became, it became kind of an evolutionary thing to get people involved in it. Yeah, I mean, that's some of the things that I've seen is that back in the day, I'm sure the guys that they got turned out how to turn on the hose and point it in the right direction and know that it was going to be pressurized and hold on if you didn't. And that was about it, probably. No, you know, there wasn't a real safety thing because you didn't think about it. You didn't have any protective equipment to go in. Now you've got a substantial amount of equipment. Protective breathing apparatus and protective equipment has, has come about uh, full circle since the space age started. It's interesting because of fabrics and other materials and lightweight. This is another factor that you consider, and uh, this, this did make a big difference when you went from a steel bottle on the self-contained breathing apparatus to a fiberglass bottle. It made a big difference. Wow. And then the harness itself has changed appreciably. Uh, we always talked about the elephant trunk on the face mask to the, to the yeah. tank, and now it's just an incorporated system uh, over your shoulder and a very small uh, tubing that comes to it. Uh, you don't even see it. Yeah, I, you're right. I hadn't thought about that. I can remember the big old tank coming oh, yeah. down. So th this has made a big difference, and of course the ease of operation makes a big difference too. The ergonomics of it uh, is important for uh, fatigue if you, want to, if you want to look at it that way. So, so this, the, so what would be a typical set of equipment that a firefighter would have today? An interior firefighter today uh, starts with the uh, boots, bunker pants, bunker jacket, uh, helmet, uh, fire hood, uh, gloves, and a self-contained breathing apparatus. Uh, some of them will even have a, a thermal imaging camera on their on the helmet or some other kind of device that uh, would, would give them light or would give them uh, indication of uh, adverse atmosphere. So it's, it's a matter of, of how much you can get on and how much wow. you want to wear. Uh, the availability of material is, is almost endless. So the, the, I call it the heavy raincoat. It's, right. it's, so that, that has also changed in, in, since tremendously. We, we started out, I had a rubber coat. Okay, I and thought it was, I was just going to say I thought it was a rubber coat. A yeah. rubber coat came down uh, midway of your of your thighs. It had a plastic helmet, and which today is uh, not necessarily plastic, but a composite material. Um, and then, of course, uh, went to uh, Nomex, which again is a space age uh, material. Uh, went from uh, shedding water to absorbing water. Uh, the, the cloth will absorb a certain amount of water, so you add weight. Uh, in a situation where you're, where you're going to get wet. So that's another factor that, that, you, that you have to think so about. So the coats today will add water to you can You can absorb a certain amount of moisture in the, in the fabric. Um, with the old rubber coat, of course, the water ran right. off, but the new fabrics uh, will absorb a certain amount. And that moisture. actually helps them with the fire protection well, in some way. Well, yes and no, but you, you have what you call a thermal barrier, then you have uh, a shield. and. So it, it's a, a universal weather coat, really. You, you wear the same coat summer, winter, fall, and 
and that's it. Sometimes you get pretty warm, other times uh, you're you glad you have that. <laughs> but you, you will sweat, there's no question about it, and of course, again, the materials will absorb some of that moisture. And it probably it keeps you maybe a little cooler if you're in a hot spot. Well, maybe I, I, not. I don't know about that, but uh, you you will be you, quite wet when you're done. And of course, gloves have made substantial changes from a plastic mitten or plastic gloves to again uh, very malleable materials. So you you have dexterity uh, with your hands and can hold materials and equipment. It's interesting because uh, I can remember the raincoats. As a kid, they were black most yep, cases absolutely. with a couple of the fluorescent stripes on the back so you could see somebody going from there. Absolutely. And the cost of this equipment is skyrocketed. It's, it's, uh, I won't say the word ridiculous, but it is expensive to outfit a firefighter. If you're, if you're looking at just the, the clothing itself, you're looking in the neighborhood of $3,500 to $4,000. Oh, my goodness. But starting from boots to helmet. And then, of course, your ear packs today, your self-contained breathing apparatus, uh, they're, they're anywhere five thousand dollars and up. Yeah, I know that as a sound town selectman yep. looked at purchasing that for our fire department, but we have no choice because your mission's completely different too than it used to be. Well, you you look at the construction industry today, what what you have for materials in new buildings versus old buildings. Uh, fire is hotter and it burns quicker, um, and the sub, the structures, I like to say, are not as sturdy as they used to be. Because you have composite materials inside, you take you take a, uh, a two by four or a two by ten that was good wooden structure versus something that's compressed wood, uh, with glues and everything and else, all the materials in it. And then that glue, of course, will give off uh, chemical residues and who who knows what's in there. And so you have to be very careful. And that's why self-contained breathing apparatus is so essential uh, because of the atmosphere. I can remember uh, years, a couple years ago when I was in the legislature, because the other thing, you had this flame retardants that got put into all the furniture. You're right. And the, the purpose for that was so that when somebody, and it was California that was actually the driver of it, because they had too many people who smoked and sat in their chair and caught their thing on fire. So they put all these rules and regulations, and since they're the biggest supplier or were at the time of fabrics for furniture, yeah. and God knows where it comes from now, they put all this flame retardant in it. And now there's real great evidence that, yes, it may stop the fire, but it smolders like the devil, and it gives off some pretty nasty stuff. The incomplete combustion is what, is what you know, we get in a lot of materials today because they, they don't have flammability. They just kind of smolder. And, uh, it, that's toxic material. Yeah, and I remember that bill we had in the legislature sitting down with Terry and saying, Terry, what do you want to do? Because some of the evidence was, eh, but some of it was really strong, and he really said, I really want you to pass this, so we did. Yeah. Contrary to the, to the producers of the product, they were a little mad at me, but I didn't care. I said, you've you got to protect the firefighters. You protect everybody. Yeah. Uh, big, big thing is today, uh, very few people die of flame. They die of asphyxia, which who knows what they're breathing in, in a very short period of time. Yeah, so you can go into a fire, get the fire out, and find somebody not burned at all. But right. they're, they're gone because they're they gone. breathe the wrong stuff. The heat, the heat and the toxicity is what gets them. So so what would the kind of training these guys go through to, to be a firefighter today? We just completed what they call Firefighter 1 and Firefighter 2, and uh, it, will vary, it will vary from 250 to 300 hours of training. Wow. Uh, nights, weekends, and then live drills. There is substantial book work that goes with this. Uh, some people don't keep up with it, and it's a problem for them. Uh, today, you can do a lot of it online, and then, of course, you have in-house, in and then you have uh, hands-on material. Uh, you can be certified Firefighter 1 and 2 upon successful completion of a written and a uh, dexterity or manual skills test. Then, of course, you continue uh, training throughout the time, and, and we have gone back to what we like to call basic firefighting. Uh, that's hose, hose advancements, water, water pressure, uh, ladders, uh, forcible entry. These are, these are the things that are going to get you where you want to go the quickest. Yeah, you can high, have the high and low angle rescue departments. You can have uh, dive teams. Uh, th these are extras, uh, hazardous material technicians, but it all takes time. And today with the society that we have, time becomes a very strong factor. Uh, 
people's jobs away from town, um, people's jobs at odd hours, and you don't have the people stepping up today that want to want to give give that time uh, and dedication to it. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, and thinking about the training, having gone over to the high school when you guys did your joint training with all the other fire departments, you have so much you've got to cover. Oh yeah, and we have a very nice training facility now. Yeah, um, I was going to talk about through that the, yeah. through the legislature and and the Fire Grant Act. We're, we're fortunate, along with uh, a couple other areas, to get a facility. And I hope that the surrounding communities, not necessarily Franklin County, but surrounding communities with an hour, an hour and a half drive, can come and use that facility. And it is, it is a facility that has a variety of opportunities, from live fire burns to um, using your ropes to descend, uh, ladder placement, uh, ventilation, uh, hose advancement through, through different rooms or stairwells or on, even on the outside of the building. Uh, we also have an opportunity there to do extrication uh, with automobiles. We have a, uh, an area that kind of designated for that, so you could actually have a car fire there. You can actually have extrication uh, practice with uh, materials that they bring in. It's, it's almost unlimited to what you can do. We have a wood water supply. We've got hydrant. We've got uh, pump facilities. Sounds like we need to come do a show on that place. You need, you I need think to go up there and, and have a tour sometime. But yeah. uh, uh, it, is a, it is a very fine facility. Uh, it took a while to get it going, but you know, with the legislature's uh, assistance, uh, with donations from local businesses and individuals, we were able to get a very fine facility to go along with the, with the uh, fire training program that we have at Mount Blue. And so are, are there students, does Mount Blue still have its, uh, tech, its technical program? They, they still have that program. Uh, interesting enough, last year because of the COVID, it was limited to a very small number. Uh, I don't know just what the enrollment will be this year, but we, we do get a number of students uh, in, in that program. Uh, and wherever they go after they've successfully completed their class, usually they've completed Firefighter 1 and 2 by the end of the year, they go into a community and become a very uh, useful uh, department member, whether it's Farmington, Wilton, Jay, wherever they, wherever they go, they have that credential with them. So they actually will get their cert certificate when they, they finish up? They can do that. Yes, they can. John Churchill still teaching that? He's still doing it. Yeah, the, he's a fi Fayette fire. fire oh, fire. yes. Dep yeah. Is he the deputy chief or assistant chief? There? I really I don't know what I his know title is now. Something like that. I see John quite a bit when I go down yep. to Fayette. Yep. And that's a nice little program up there. So you actually can have a fire up there and put it out? Yes, we have two burn rooms in that, really? in that uh, structure. And again, you just don't go in and set a fire. You, you've got to have... Uh, numerous people there. You've got to have certain materials that you can burn and can't burn, and it's very it's very controlled. Uh, interesting enough, uh, some people think it's not necessary, but it is because you want to you want to maintain the structure first of all, and you want to do it in a safe and, and orderly manner. Well, it just makes sense to me to have something like that. I mean, I'm glad that you guys finally got it because yeah. it makes all the sense in the world to train realistically. Because if you train and train and train, when it actually is the real thing. It just becomes automatic. Yeah. It's, uh, you, can't, you can't be doing something 75% of the time. You've got to be able to do it very quickly and do it correctly. So if, if in, in the has response realm, so if I were calling, there was a fire called in, how would the group respond? Well, we, we are fortunate in Farmington to have full-time firefighters 24-7, seven, seven days a week. Uh, again, thanks to the, to the citizens of Farmington uh, who over a period of time uh, saw this to be necessary with the population and what we have here for uh, dwellings and people and institutions, they would immediately respond within, hopefully within two minutes. Wow. The call people would come in on, on the uh, end of that, so to speak, as they would come from their homes or businesses or wherever they would be at that time and you would have uh, probably at least two, possibly three apparatus that would respond to the situation depending on what the call is. There are some calls that we don't have to have a lot of people participate in. And there are other calls, of course, you need a full company and then you call in your neighbors because you just don't have people. Mutual aid. And the, the mutual aid is a godsend, not only to this town, but to many communities in this, across the entire state. 
a mutual aid for those that aren't watching it, just say that if you have an incident in Farmington but you need extra hands, Wilton can be called in or Jay can be called right. in. And right. they're under the same work protections that yep. they normally would have because they've been called into the situation. Right. And the interesting thing with mutual aid, uh, even today, we, we do train together. We do have common meetings and discuss policies and procedures. And, and through the uh, training, we get to know each other better and we know the skills that, that we can call upon uh, in neighboring towns. And you actually do some pre-planning too, if I remember. There are, there are a number of pre-plans. Uh, it takes time. Uh, and of course, once you get it pre-planned, somebody's going to change it because they're going to make an addition or a deletion or the building is going to be a different purpose. So you, it's a continuum and you can't keep up with it because there's just so much of it going on. But uh, we do have pre-plans for many of the facilities in town here. I remember in Wilton, they used to have one for the old uh, Will the woolen mill. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, that was just a case of stage the trucks and protect the other houses. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the schools uh, have been very have been very uh, helpful in giving us uh, layouts of schools and, and knowing where certain facilities are kept, uh, and it does make a difference. Uh, you know, you, you, you go to, we'll take Mountain Blue High School, for example, the size of it. You just can't drive up there and start looking. You have to know a location. And the systems within them, the fire alarm systems, sometimes will tell you a zone or an area where the alarm is coming from. So it makes it easier for you to get to that facility. So the, by pulling the alarm doesn't necessarily just mean it's a general alarm. You probably can tell where that alarm came it, from. It may be a general alarm, but the, the uh, display panel board will, will point to particular uh. zones. So you can have somebody can look at it and you'll, you'll have a blinker on there indicating that's where the, where the uh, tone came from. And you have the same relationship with a lot of the businesses that are a here. A lot of businesses. And, and we have uh, uh, what they call a Knox box. Uh, with, a, with a common key that the fire department has, and the owner doesn't even have a key to it. So we can get into a facility uh, rather than breaking into the facility. We can just open the door and go in. And that key is just a key for getting into the facility? Key getting into the, into the facility and to the area that the, that the property owner wants you to be able to get into. Wow. So what's in that box uh, may vary to one key or maybe several keys. And the boxes do vary in size because of size of buildings that you need to get into, which uh, has made it much easier uh, to, to get to the seat of something rather than waiting for someone to come and unlock the door. You don't want to break into it or break windows if you don't have to. Uh, and we encourage people to, when they build a facility, to put an ox box on. Makes a lot of life a lot easier. It, for it, everybody. Everybody, yeah. yeah. And I remember that being talked about, but is it not called a Knox box? Yes, K-N-O-X. K-N-O-X, yeah. huh, interesting. I know that the issue of recruiting is tough. I mean, it used to be in the day that everybody that worked in town was part of the fire department. Right. So if there was an incident, and like at Bashu, when Bashu was in Wilton, sure. they knew that they could release their workers because someday that fire might be at their facility and they certainly want their guys to be prepared. But that's changed so much it's now changed appreciably today and you and you can understand uh, with a shortage of people wanting to work or working and then having somebody leave the business it's going to leave the, the business owner short-handed uh, how long is that person going to be gone you have no idea maybe 20 minutes it may be two hours and this does make a difference and uh, many many business owners are very reluctant today to give people that time so how are you guys recruiting? How, how are the numbers? I know that when Terry came on one time, the average age was 100. Well, the average age is, is up. There's no yeah. question about it. But word of mouth is the primary re way of recruiting. Um, a lot of people in, in our communities do not look for a want ad or hiring people uh, in the newspaper. It's word of mouth. Uh, there is a legacy in families that, that follows along with that. And then there are some people that are just wanting to do fire service work. And therefore, they come and make application and um, probably are accepted or at least given an opportunity on a probationary uh, basis to see if it fits them. There are, there are people that the fire service does not fit. And there are others who will just take it and run. Yeah. And so it's, it's word of mouth. It's the education, uh, like at the high school and other programs of similar nature throughout the state. It's, it's interesting uh, how many uh, vocational programs there are in Maine. And, and we started it back in 01, 
uh, thanks to the legislature and uh, director of the tech center and fire chief, and it, it has worked out. And, and you're actually in this thing that uh, this is a regional school, so you've got kids. This is not just Farmington. These no. are our SAB 9 students. You've got some from Livermore Falls or have in the past because oh, I've yeah. gone to some of the graduations, Livermore Falls, um, Rangeley, and so forth. They come down to be part of this. Anybody that wants to come to that program and furnish his or her transportation probably would be welcome. And we've, had, we've had students from Peru. We've had students really? from Oakland that have come to it. And we've had uh, adults uh, come to that program in the past years, uh, depending upon what their schedule was. So it, it's not limited just to uh, high school students. If the, it, adult education could also uh, be involved in it if they so desired. Now, the kids that do come to that don't have to buy their equipment, though. You provide the, that. They have to be sponsored by a fire department. Fire department, OK. And All right. the fire department uh, uh, will give them the necessary materials and support that they need. Okay. And fire departments over the years have been very supportive of bringing uh, apparatus uh, to live burns or to training uh, for pumping hose advancements and things of that nature. So it's, it's been a uh, regional support program. Uh, hopefully, uh, the, the sending schools will continue to do that. And uh, we have in the past gone to talk to guidance counselors and also students who were interested in the fire program. Now, doesn't University of Southern Maine Community College or Southern Maine Community College have right. a firefighting program? They do, uh, fire science, and uh, we have we have gone down there with the class on several time occasions to visit the school and get the insight of, of what the what the uh, science fire science program entails, and and we've had several students from our program go to Southern Maine. Uh, graduate with an associate degree and become professional firefighters across the state uh, from Bangor to South Florida and Scarborough and all places in between. Uh, it, it's, it's a good program and the students coming out of that program do well. Uh, we of course want people to be involved with EMS, emergency um, medical, and that's, that's the, the trend today is um, EMS people and then we train to be firefighters. It's, it's just a 180 degree switch. We used to do it the other way around. We'd train firefighters and then they'd become EMS and now we train EMS to become firefighters. I'm okay. Wow. But, you know, that's, that's, that's the emphasis today. And, uh, so what we could do real quick before I forget is let's put Clyde's phone number up. Uh, so because if he said that he would take a call if anybody has a question on this thing uh, about participating in these training programs sure. and so forth. Seven seven eight two eight zero nine is right there, Clyde. You okay. see, it's right, right, right yeah. below my finger. All right. Uh, but for more information, don't hesitate to give Clyde a call because he'd certainly like to have you join part of what's going on out there. It's, you know, the the more information we get out there and and talk to people and answer their questions, the better they understand what goes on. The fire department is always open for people to come and see what goes on and ask questions. I, I mean, like I told you earlier. We are, we are the stewards of town property. That's a good point, so keep going and, on that. And, and the citizen entrusts us with several millions of dollars worth of equipment. We try to take care of it the best we can and use it most economically. Uh, it's their facility. Come and visit. Say hello. Shoot the breeze with the guys. It's, it's your facility. And then you started to talk a little bit about the fire trucks because the uh, quality of the fire trucks, although they can perform, they, they're not as, as nice as, or as sturdy as they used to be. The, the, the fabric, the material in which they're making things out of today does not meet the standard that it did, we'll say, 15 or 20 years ago. I mean, that's across the board, not just fire trucks, but even our own personal cars and things that you buy. Uh, the, it's, what does it call, a manufactured obsolescence. Um, it's, it's there, and it's real. So, you know, fire trucks that used to last 25, 30 years, Today may only last 20, and uh, interestingly and, enough, people say, well, you don't use it. You don't use that fire truck. Well, that's, a, that's money in your pocket. Why do we go out? We go out because there is a situation that requires our services. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like uh, the bill is $10, and if 10 of us pay it, that's a dollar a piece. However, we get one of those people drop out, Nine of us have got to pay the $10 bill. Same thing is true if we lose property. The rest of us have to pick up that slack because the towns have the same amount of money that they've got to raise. 
So if you take away businesses, you take away property, that's taxpayer dollars. Well, I even think about, I think about it differently. That's why I've always helped Sonny at the fire department is that truck might be the truck that puts the fire out at my house. Absolutely. And so my insurance rate, and people forget about that, my insurance rate is driven by your capacity to come out and put that fire out. So if you're lacking a truck there, I may actually be paying more on my insurance rating, yep. or look, my rating be more dangerous, therefore my insurance premium would be higher if you guys weren't able to respond. People always ask, how much is it going to change my insurance? It may not change it appreciably, but it will either keep it the way it is or reduce it over a period of time because of the quality of services. And it's not just fire department, it's dispatch, it's water, and what you have for availability of personnel that all factor into that. And this is it's just a complicated situation when you start talking about insurance. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it gets, but that's the way I always think about yeah. it, is that that's going to be the one truck. Just show me that you really need it, and I will never question it. And Sonny knows that over it's, in Wilson. It's interesting. That truck sits down there 24-7, fully loaded, ready to go, I'm going to say, in an instant. So it's, it's got to be kept up. It's got to be used uh, by operators so they're familiar with it, so that when they use it, we give you the best service that we can. Yeah, and you know, even if some people think, well, why are you giving rides to kids like we did? But that's important because that's getting the driver so that he has more time behind the wheel because he may not be going out on an emergency, but he's actually using the roads and so forth that he needs to learn how to do it. I, look to, I like to have it uh, as a public relations thing because those children are going to be the taxpayers of tomorrow. And if they're comfortable, they're going to be more willing to support fire departments. Um, I was told many years ago when I used to go down to Lewiston that you go up on the schoolhouse roof and get the wiffle ball or the disc or whatever's up there. And you the throw cat, the cat in the tree. That's oh, what you yeah. mean. No, no. But they, those kids remember that, that the fire department came and got the stuff off the roof that we'd thrown up there somehow. And when it comes time to pay taxes or be participatory or vote, uh, those people may be the ones that make the difference. Oh, I, the way I think about it is back when I was in kindergarten, and it was fire prevention day, and the fire trucks showed up, and we all got to go sit on the stand on the back, and then get off the back, and then hold the hose, and Absolutely. didn't wa didn't have water coming through it because they're probably taking those kindergartners and flipped them. Yeah. And that was a long time ago, but that's what was my first introduction to the fire department. And that's and that's how you get people interested in the fire service by by showing your equipment, letting people come and put their hands on it and ask questions about it, yeah. and that's. You know, it's just good PR. So, Clyde, what you're saying, too, for the people that are watching the show, if you really want to see it, come to the fire department. Absolutely. It's could, a, doors open. Yeah. I mean, I've been there for other reasons, but right. I know the doors are open, and I, I feel, always feel welcome when I come in. And both of it be my fire department or Farmington's fire department, the guys are very proud of what they've got. Uh, we, we have a lot of youth groups that come in. Uh, we try to get out to visit uh, senior areas. Uh, we try to uh, accommodate... Uh, small groups of people, uh, Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts have, have yeah. come for years. Uh, some youth groups, 4-H clubs have come for, for a tour and, and uh, ask questions about, we'll say, farm safety or about living in an apartment building or what do I do in this situation. So those are all important, important characteristics. Wow. So, so as we, we get ready to close, what words would you like to give to people about the fire department that they might rem you know, they remember the beginning of the show and the end of the show? Well, I would, I would say that they need to remember that it's there for their use. Uh, we're, we're at your beck and call, so to speak. But at the same time, uh, we have educational materials that will help you be a better citizen and protect yourself and your family. Uh, think about smoke alarms. We have, we have a program, if you need a smoke alarm, don't hesitate to come to your fire department and ask them because they have ways of getting smoke alarms for you. And uh, we'll talk to you about use, talk to you about taking care of them and maintenance of it. So it, it's something that people need to be familiar with uh, because it is their opportunity uh, for safety. And it's their opportunity to see where their tax dollar goes. And protect themselves and protect their families and their property. So, yeah. Clyde, thank you. That was well, thank great. Thank you. Great I've great enjoyed this. Great conversation. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks. For, and again, Clyde's phone number, we can put it up real quick, Tommy, if you could, so in case you have any questions related to this, so you can give you a call. I think it's coming slowly but surely, but well, maybe not. But anyway, you saw it before. 778 2809. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. That was perfect. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Very good.